today, so I'm sure you're very quiet. That way Carl will tell them they, they can have a, uh, a good message uh, brought to them, so we're excited about that. We're glad you're here today. A few announcements. Um, coming up uh, tonight, we have Awanas. Um, it'll be December 2nd, going caroling at Eastland, so you guys can come. Josh, you can help Carol, can't you? But, okay. Maybe. It'll be a fun time at Eastland on December 2nd. And our Christmas program, just a few weeks away, which I think Rachel has already started working on, is December 15th. But here. We, well, we might have to change that. Okay. Can we turn mine on too? There, is that better? Great. All right. Um, we're glad for everyone recovering from all the different surgeries and illnesses. I know Larry Boblet's back home, and uh, Carl is. I'm still healing up um, at his home, so things are looking good. You've got another procedure on the 12th, so we'll continue to pray for that and uh, back to work soon and all that. Back. You are back? Yeah. Very good. Are, are, are you excited about that? Yeah. 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 Very, very, very. very good. Well, we will start our worship service and sing our doxology. <laughs>
Father in heaven, Lord in Jesus' name, we here before you today, Lord God, and worship you for who you are to us, and your many blessings to us, and your love to us. And Lord, we just uh, thank you, Lord, today for all that and much more. And Lord, we just uh, ask your blessing on the ones that are here today <laughs> to worship you with us, Father. We ask your blessing on our uh, service folks, the armed services, Lord, that you protect them, Lord, wherever they're at, serving their country and uh, keeping it the freedoms we have here, the freedom to worship you, Lord, and uh, we just pray for your protection over them, Lord. Uh, Father, we now ask your blessing, Lord, on your this service to you to, uh, and on your word to us that our hearts will be open and attending to receive your word today. And we ask for understanding of it also, Lord, and application to our lives, Lord. And we now ask your blessing on this offering we take that it'll be used for your ministry here. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> So right now we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. As you know, the Lord's Supper, as it says on the front of our table here, we do in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross when he raised from the dead. This is uh, something we do symbolic to represent his body that he gave up and the blood that he shed for our forgiveness of sins. And today in Sunday school, we are talking about the idea of confessing our sins and keeping short accounts with God and that kind of idea. And it made me think about this act that we're about to go through at the Lord's Supper and Paul um, talks about when you take the Lord's Supper, do so in a worthy manner. And some people have meant that, taken that to mean only if you're a Christian, which if you're not a Christian, I don't know why you would want to take the Lord's Supper, commemorating something that you don't believe in. I don't really think that's what Paul had in mind. I think what Paul had in mind is what we were speaking of in Sunday school, that keeping of short accounts, not celebrating the communion while harboring in your heart sins for which you are unrepentant, sins for which you look forward to committing again, as it were, sins that you know God has been convicting you of that you have yet to bring to him to say, I acknowledge and I ask for you to help me.
do this. So I'm going to voice a prayer for all of us just in that idea of coming in a worthy manner, keeping short accounts with God. And as I pray, please feel free on your own. Keep short accounts with God. Get your heart not right. If you're a Christian, you're already forgiven. But get your heart right in the sense of bringing to God whatever it is that you might have been trying to hide from a God you can't hide anything from anyway. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you celebrating um, just what you did for us on the cross, Lord, the entire reason we are here this morning to worship you, the reason we saw, call ourselves after your name as Christians, Lord. I just pray that as we do accept your sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord, we still are far from perfect, Lord. So please forgive us for the sins that we commit. Please uh, just bring to mind any of those things that maybe we are ignoring that you are trying to Bring us closer to you in our lives. Please just help us to seek what you have for us over what we would want to do when left to our own devices and to our own flesh, Lord. And right now, for any and all of us in here who might be harboring something in our heart that, Lord, we're just refusing to acknowledge before you, Lord, let us be like David when the prophet Nathan came to him, Lord, and just fall before you on our face and just, just pray, Lord, that we can just mend that relationship and come back closer to you, Lord. Praise things to your, your name. Amen. Right now, Bill and Randy are going to come around with the bread and with the cup. I ask that you take one of each whenever they come around and then hold them until um, they come back up here. At what became known as the Last Supper, I don't know that the disciples realized at the time that it was such. Jesus started with the bread, broke it, and he said, this represents my body. And it's a very significant thing that Christ gave up his body for us. Not just that, but that he came in his body. The writer of Hebrews tells us we don't have somebody going before God who doesn't know what we're going through, who doesn't understand what temptations we face. We have somebody going before God who actually lived in flesh. And so we thank God for Jesus who came in flesh and gave up his body for us. And he said, take eat, this do in remembrance of me. Bill, would you voice a prayer of gratitude for the body of Christ, please? Lord, we thank you, Father, for your great love to us. You sent your only son to die on the cross for us. We just praise you that he was willing to do that because of his love for us. And he has a, in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture also tells us that the fruit of the vine Jesus says it represents my blood. Scripture tells us that 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we understand Jesus had to go to the cross because sin deserves death. And he went to be that one who died for us so that we could live with him. And he said, this drink, you remember to me. Randy, if you would please thank God for his word. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just bow and we pause. And Lord, we remember to think about the excruciating death, the shedding of blood, Lord, um, the significance of that. And Lord, may we never forget the cost of our sin and the cost of our redemption, Lord. We are thankful and praise you for sending your Son, his shedding of blood, that we may have fullness of life, that we may have eternal life with you forever, Lord. Uh, may we, as we go out, be reminded and renewed of the great cost that it cost your son Christ to die for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
open up to James chapter 2 with me, and when you found that, please stand with me. Now, Patty had this idea that I thought was a good idea um, to film the service, uh, since Carl's not able to be here with us, and also to uh, take to Otella and anyone else that might want to be able to <laughs> worship with us. I can't make it in person. And just on the off chance that Carl is watching this and has requested that we have services only with Rachel singing and playing, where I don't necessarily have to preach, I just need to say straight to the camera, Carl, do not turn this off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's read together the second half of James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have works, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray together. So Lord, we just thank you for uh, your word to us as we've been working our way through this letter from James, as it can be challenging, Lord, to our, um, to our lives sometimes, uh, just to really think about not just the fact that you died for our salvation in eternity, Lord, but that, Lord, you, you didn't just save us from death and hell, Lord, but you saved us from a living death in this life, Lord, that you, that you have saved us to be able to live a joyful, a peace-filled, a purposeful life while we're here, Lord. And, Lord, we just thank you for uh, inspiring by your spirit to James to write these words that can just push us in that direction to say, you're saved, now what? And Lord, I just pray as we go through this passage this morning that you will convict each of us something in our lives where we need to be putting our faith into practice. Praise things in your name. Amen. So this passage of scripture is, while seemingly straightforward when you read it by itself, when you take it together with the rest of the New Testament, it can be a quite difficult passage of scripture. It's one of the most difficult to teach on, it's one of the most difficult to preach on, and mainly because... So many people have argued against it, and so many people have disliked this passage of Scripture, and so many people have read into it what I don't think James ever intended. So we're going to start out just addressing the elephant in the room that, at first glance, when only taking this passage by itself, it does look like this passage of Scripture stands apart from the rest of the New Testament. Um, and I also want to just say that as people read this passage... They're kind of sent a lot of times into one of two extremes. Some people are sent into a constant downward spiral, constantly doubting their faith, constantly just saying, well, I keep sinning, so there's no way I'm saved, and I'm not doing everything I know I should be doing. I know I'm not sharing my faith the way I should. I know I, I saw a homeless guy on the corner the other day, and I didn't roll down my window and hand him money, so that's a good work that I didn't do, and I, there's this one sin that I just can't seem to wipe out, so do I really have faith if I, if I just can't stop sinning, if I can't do all the good things I should do? So that's one direction that some people go after reading this. Other people, we'll call them pharisaical, are those who will read this passage, and they'll become self-satisfied. And they'll just reflect on all the good things they have done. And they'll reflect on all the bad things that they have not done, ignoring the bad things they have done. And so a lot of people either go to a self-doubting place, or they go to a place of self-righteousness, and just feeling like they have earned their salvation because they believe in Jesus, and they have earned it also with their works. And so the first one, the constant self-doubting, I'm going to say... 
I think James would be in agreement with 1 John, where if you read 1 John, it has very much the same feel, where John says over and over, if you love Jesus, you're going to live for him. You're going to obey his commandments. You're going to love each other. And so I think James and John are written which much, with much that same feel, but John tells them over and over, my motivation for writing these things to you is not to make you doubt your salvation, but much more so that you can feel confident in your salvation because you know that, okay, yeah, you're still a sinner. You still, you still struggle, but think about who you were beforehand. Think about who you would be. Think about the base nature that you have and the things that enter your head that the Holy Spirit keeps away or the things you would never want to do that the Holy Spirit convicts you and you go and you love people that you never would have loved. So John says, so I'm, I'm showing you. This is evidence that you have faith in Christ and a saving faith. And so James is writing in much the same way to say, what is saving faith in Christ? And he makes it clear. It's not just believing God exists. Because if that's true, I mean, Satan has talked face to face with God on several occasions. He lived in heaven for a time. And we see in the book of Job, he still, even after he was fallen, had access to go talk to God directly. So James says, okay, you believe there's a God. That puts you on par with demons so far. Probably not quite up to saving faith just yet. And so there is a difference between just saying, there's a God. There's a difference between saying, I believe there's a man named Jesus who came and did good things and died for a good cause. There's a difference between an intellectual ascension to this idea that Jesus died for our sins and an actual faith giving all and saying, all my eggs are in this one basket, as it were. I am putting my entire faith in Christ. And James says, and when that faith comes, something happens. So let's just first of all just look at saying, you know, what's the difference between James and Paul, as it were? Why do so many people say they contradict? First of all, I think we need to acknowledge when you write a letter, I don't know if anybody still write letters. Not really. Emails maybe, I don't know. But when you write a letter, you have somebody in mind that you're writing to. And whatever your relationship with them is, whatever the information you're trying to convey, you're going to sometimes make assumptions that they already have some knowledge of your relationship, they already have some knowledge of what you're trying to say, and you're not going to be extra wordy and make it longer than it needs to be. And in the same way, when Paul and when James write their letters, they're writing to a particular audience, assuming a particular base of knowledge, and trying to get to a particular point. So let's just say whenever, you know, the main accusation is that James's letter contradicts with Paul's letter of Romans especially. Well, who was Paul writing to with Romans? He was writing to a church that he had never attended, a church where he really didn't know the people. It's not one of the ones he planted. He did not know what they knew. You know, as you read his other letters, he kept saying, remember when I was there and I told you this? Do you remember that? With Romans, he can't do that because he was never there and he had never told them. So he starts at the very beginning in Romans, I mean the very beginning, and says, hey, look out at the trees. That's proof there is a God. I mean, he starts right at the very beginning with saying, we have to acknowledge there is a God. And then he moves on to the gospel, the simple gospel. Why do we call particular verses in Romans a Romans road when we try to describe the gospel to somebody? Because Paul made the gospel message clearer in the book of Romans than it is in any other book of the Bible because he is writing to an audience that he's saying, I don't know what you know already. So I want to make this as simple as possible, and I want to make sure you know faith alone. And so he is writing to that group. James is writing to a group who he is saying, I already know what you guys know. I know you guys have heard the gospel. I know you guys have heard faith alone. And now you're abusing it. And now you're saying, I'm saved. So hey, let's, let's party. Why not? And so James is not trying to get the gospel into their hands because he knows that his audience already has the gospel. He's trying to say, you have the milk, let's have some steak now. Let's move on to that solid meat. Let's see what next. So let's just look at some of the accusations. Let's look at a couple of these places where this passage in particular is said to contradict what Paul says. The first one is Romans 4, 1 through 3. You're free to flip there with me if you want or if you want to write it down and um, like a Berean before you, look it up later and make sure I'm not lying to you. But Paul says in Romans 4, verses 1 through 3, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. And flip ahead just a few pages to Romans chapter 10, verses 10 through 13. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. One of my favorites, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, not by works. So that no man may boast. So what did you do to earn your salvation, according to Paul? Nothing. There is nothing you did to earn your salvation. And here's where this gets difficult. Whenever Paul in Romans 4 wanted to show that you're saved by faith alone, what example did he use? Abraham. Whenever James showed that works accompany faith, for salvation, what example did he use? Abraham. And that's why people say, well, these cannot be in agreement with each other. And as a Protestant denomination, I mean, we rest on 500 years of this idea of faith alone, by grace alone, through Jesus alone, to the of God alone, as explained in Scripture alone. We believe in those five solas, that idea that you're not saved by your works, you're saved by the grace of God through your faith. Well, how does that work whenever we come to James and he makes a big deal out of saying faith without works is dead. You can't be saved just by your faith. You can't be saved if your faith doesn't have works. And how does that not contradict? Well, let's first of all just start out with where is our starting point as Christians when it comes to Scripture? Number one, all Scripture is God-breathed. And so... There's two different ways to come to Scripture whenever you see two passages that seem to contradict or seem to not completely agree. Do you believe that the God who created the entire universe would send out conflicting messages? Do you believe that the God who through His Spirit wrote through these authors, inspired these authors to write the words they wrote? Do you believe that He is so ignorant that He gave Paul one message and then James a different message and said, whoops, I didn't mean to do that? No. Do we believe that if all Scripture is God-breathed, do we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that all Scripture is true? And, and if all Scripture is true, then you can't have two contradictory messages in there. All right, well, with that being in mind, we have men of faith who have said, all right, I believe all Scripture is God-breathed, therefore, we should probably kick James out of the Bible. i got to tell you, as your pastor, I don't just believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that we have in this book right here. I believe in the inerrancy of God as the almighty creator of the universe. He led godly men to compile these 66 books. I believe in the inerrancy of the words on the page. I believe in the inerrancy of the compilation of these 66 books. And so that's going to leave us right there with saying, all right, well, we have to make sure Paul and James make peace with each other somehow because if the almighty God of the universe breathed out all scripture, and then inspired men to compile the books that he considered to be that holy scripture together, they can't, they can't contradict each other. And I would say, once we start with that starting point as Christians, we're going to say, there's got to be an explanation. Well, the explanation, as with all biblical interpretation, comes with what? Context. Always look at context. Uh, if you watch the news anymore, it's all about taking things out of context. You... You know, somebody gives an hour-long interview, and they cut the three little 10-second clips out that they want to be able to paint a person in the picture that they want them to be. And we get annoyed by that, as we should. Well, people do the same thing with Scripture all the time. So let's just look at, I showed you a places where it seemed to contra contradict. Well, let's notice that Paul actually did not just write the Romans Road. Paul did not just write Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He went on. So the two main verses that we are looking at today that seem to contradict in people's minds are 17 and 26. 17 says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And 26 says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Can such faith save a person? 
Well, let's go back just immediately to Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves is a free gift of God, so that no man may boast. Why? To do the works that were prepared beforehand for you to do. We should never stop in the middle of a sentence in the Bible. Why were you saved by grace through faith? So that you can live out your faith for God. In Ephesians, again, in verses 5, 1 through 3, I have to flip to that one. That one I do not have memorized. I apologize. Ephesians 5, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. You're saved by grace through faith. Now get your act together. Paul's pretty clear about that. And then let's go back to that book that he seems to be contradicting in James. Let's go back to Romans. Now let's flip ahead to chapter 12. So we love the book of Romans. Why? Because it gives us the message of salvation. It gives us a message of grace through faith. And it's not of ourselves. You can't earn it. It is a free gift. It is amazing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But yet Christ died for us. It's a glorious message. So what? Chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore. Remember, when therefore is in the Bible, go back and see what it's there for. Chapters 1 through 11 of Romans is Paul saying, here is the gospel. Here is what Christ has done for you. Here is the saving grace of God, why it was necessary for Jesus to die. Here is how that can be bestowed on you. Here is how his blood can be applied to you. So therefore, because Jesus died for your sins and offers this free gift of salvation, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and by, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So when we don't just cherry pick a few passages from Paul, all of a sudden it seems like Paul had a lot of this same message that James did. Did he word it in the same way? No. But yes, Romans 4 and James 2, when put side by side, seem to contradict. But nowhere, and I just chose a couple of examples of Paul, nowhere does Paul ever say, oh, you're saved? See you in heaven. Till then, enjoy. He constantly reminds people, God didn't just save you from damnation and hell. God saved you from the pain of sin in this life. Now, get, get right with him. It's not a challenge to earn your salvation afterwards. It's a challenge to live in the Spirit to have the life that God has offered through his death. Not only does, do we see that you know, he doesn't contradict Paul, but we see Jesus in a couple of passages saying much the same thing. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Here's the point. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus flat out says, I've come to save you. Now let people see what a saved life looks like. Let them see that joy. Let them see that peace. Let them see that love. Let them see those fruits of the Spirit. Let them see what my children are all about. And so we see James has been accused of contradicting. People have tried to kick him out of the Bible. And I, people during the Reformation, I give a slight pass to just because they didn't have a lot of great commentaries to go to. And they were dealing with the Catholic Church that was trying to tell them, no, it's not faith alone. You have to earn your salvation alone. So I can get where they were coming from. I'm glad that 500 years later we have helped put it back into context to say that's not what was going on. This is just all about, what are these words? James. Faith that works is the entire theme to this, uh, this series that we're doing as we go through the book of James. So Paul and Jesus, as well as all the other New Testament authors, they put faith and works not separate. It's not an either or. It's a both and. You can't have one without the other. 
If you need any further proof, if I haven't convinced you yet, we're going to go to a really famous chapter in the Bible. When I grew up with Bible drills, we had to memorize some verses of the Bible. We also had things called key passages. So when they said the Ten Commandments, I had to know Exodus 20, look it up, and step forward. The love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, I had to look it up, step forward. Well, we had one called the faith chapter. The faith chapter, or some people call it the faith hall of fame. Randy, what do you refer to it as? Hall of Heroes. Hall of Heroes, there we go. Whatever you might refer to it as, it is a chapter describing faith. It gives a description or a definition of faith at the very beginning of it, and it goes on to describe men and women who possessed that very faith. We have a lot of, and they did not go very far into the Old Testament, by the way. They had a lot of examples right at the beginning. They didn't go very far into the history of Israel. We have Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Moses' mother and sister, not by name, but by story, Joshua, Rahab, and then he says, and I don't even have time to tell you about all the others. Like, I, this chapter's already long enough. I, I, I'm not going to just bore you with every. I just want you guys to get the point. These people all had faith. Well, it's a pretty long chapter, so he didn't just say, hey, here's a list of ten people. They had faith. You should too. They believed in Jesus. You should too. Whenever he listed a person and said they had exemplary faith, guess what he did right afterwards? He gave an action. He gave some way that they followed in their life that showed that they had faith. By faith, Abel offered an acceptable sacrifice, an action of giving a sacrifice that came from true faith. By faith, Noah built the ark. What good would it have been for Noah to say, God, I believe you. You're going to flood the whole world and you're going to kill everybody. But nah, I don't really want to build the ark. Could such faith have saved him? Nope. I think he would have drowned along with everybody else. By faith, Abraham, he moved away from the safety of his home. Let's take the Bible out of our context and put it back into the historical context. It's not like moving an hour up the road where you can still come see your family on the weekends. I mean, that's leaving everything you know, going to an possibly unfriendly group where you don't, not only don't have a job, I mean, you don't have a place to live, you don't know what's going to happen. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Sarah conceived Isaac. By faith, after Isaac, this is an example that both Paul and um, James used. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac to be sacrificed. And he's not named, but I just feel like Isaac had to have been big enough at that time that there was some faith on Isaac's part as well, even though he wasn't named there. I don't hear any stories of him struggling once he realized what was going on. It says, by faith, Joseph blessed his descendants and gave instructions while they are in Egypt. And here's what's cool about Joseph's story in Hebrews 11, the way that they break it down. They had just moved to Egypt because of the famine, and his brothers came, and Joseph has not seen what the nation is going to become yet. And he says, hey, after this whole slavery thing, after this whole thing that God has promised to Abraham that we're going to be sojourners, here's how you need to leave this land and take my bones with you and bury them over there. By faith, he gave them instructions on what to do 400 years in the future because he knew that God was going to deliver on his promises. By faith, Moses' mother and sister hid him, knowing that that was what God had for them. By faith, Moses rejected, rejected living in Pharaoh's household. Just imagine that. All right, who do I want to associate with? my cultural people who are in slavery, or do I want to keep enjoying all the riches of being the richest house in the world? By faith, he rejected that. And by faith, he came back years later and stood up to Pharaoh, and I don't know if he actually said, let my people go in a Charlton Heston type of voice, but you know, <laughs> very boldly stood up to Pharaoh by faith. By faith, Joshua, this is one of the craziest stories of the Bible. Joshua, a military leader, for seven days, let people walking around this impenetrable fort of Jericho. What, what's the battle plan, sir? No, just walk around and go back to your tent and hang out for the rest of the day until tomorrow we're going to do it again. How much faith did that take to just walk around for seven days? By faith, Rahab hid the spies. And so we see time and time again... How do we know these Hall of Heroes? How do we know this faith chapter? How do we know all these heroes of the Old Testament had faith? Because of what they did. And so in the same way, how do we know that Jesus saves? How do we know that what he offers is real? Because we can see a difference. 
And man, I wish there was an exact way that I could describe it. These are just highlights. I mean, Abraham lived to be over 100 years old, and we have a few highlights of his life. There are some people that we have one story. I mean, Gideon, we don't know very much about Gideon. He's named as one of the extras, as it were, you know, in the Book of Heroes or the Hall of Heroes. He's one of those extras. We know one little short story from his life where he acted in a big, obedient way. He's called a man of faith. And so what does it look like day after day to live in faith and when it's not all these big things that we're going to be recorded in, you know, perpetuity, as you will, you know, whenever we're not going to make the history books, each and every one of us by any means, what does our faith look like? And it really is just a day in, day out, living out the promises of God. If you obey my commandments, you will have the life I have laid out for you. And so that brings us to the very definition that Hebrews 11 gives us of what faith is. No, excuse me, that was the wrong version. So Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith is just simply believing what you can't prove ahead of time. It's setting, I mean, let's put the scientific process to it even if you want. Science and God are not exclusive from each other. Let's set the hypothesis that if I have faith in Christ and live according to his commandments, my life is going to be more filled with the promises that he has laid out. That I will find joy, I will find peace, I will find love, I will find forgiveness, I will see his fruit coming through my life if I live according to that. And so that, that is what faith is, is believing that the God who created the universe and the God who died for our sins, when he says, here's the life that I want you to live, here's the works I have for you to do, not just the things I don't want you to do, you know, let's not go that direction, he does both and, there's things he says, no, I don't want you doing this, we talked about that at prayer meeting on Wednesday night, the works of the flesh are obvious, those are obvious things, we... It's not hard to know what you shouldn't do. He says, but the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, those things don't come naturally. Those things do not come in and of themselves. And so faith is believing that, hey, when God saved me, it was so that I could have these fruits. It was so that I could live a life that is Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. So what is the purpose of faith? Well, it's saving, number one. Let's acknowledge that. That is the very base message of Christianity, is we believe in eternal life. We believe that we have souls that exist forever. And so by faith, we believe Jesus died for our sins so we can live with him after this life. And then the question is always comes to my mind, so why am I still here? Why, if the whole point is eternal life, do I not just pray the sinner's prayer, as it were, and then drop dead and go to heaven? That would... That would seem to be if the whole point is that, you know, as the Christian bookstores sell the get out of hell free cards, if that's the whole point, then why continue living? Well, obviously that's not the entire point. It's a main point, but not the entire point. And so the first thing about our faith and about our actions following that is we can see through living this life, number one, that we do have a saving faith. Not trying to trick ourselves, not trying to earn it, not trying to put the cart before the horse as it were, but seeing that our faith pulls those good works. Our faith has a, something to it. And again, I think one of the worst authors of all time has written one of the best titles of, book, of a book of all time, and Joel Osteen, Your Best Life Now. I believe fully that that's what God has for us. And I see that in a couple places in Romans, Romans 3, 30 through 31. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So Paul says, the joy is not just in being forgiven away from the law. It is in seeing the law as a gift and not as a burden. And he goes further, and I think this is the more poignant point that he makes in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? One of my favorite answers ever. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. I, I love the example he uses there, calling slave or calling sin a slave master. And really, as human beings, in a way, we are all slaves. Um, you know, the great prophet and poet Bob Dylan says, you've got to serve somebody. It might be the devil and it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. And man, I wish he would have understood those words better than he seemed to, but though, such a good point they make. That as a human being, you're going to serve your own passions and desires of the flesh, or you're going to serve the spirit of God and serve God and make your life about glorifying him and bringing praise to him. And so I love this example he has of number one, slavery, because whether we acknowledge it or not, we are servants, we are slaves to either our passions or to Christ. And number two, because as you read Romans 6, you just start to think, you know, we, we all went through American history, right? We, we learned about the Underground Railroad, and we learned about these people who just had to get north of that Mason-Dixon line so that they could be free. And what kind of an idiot would have turned around and said, I'm going back to Georgia? Who would have done that? Well, let's read Exodus. I want to go back to Egypt. It's hot out here in the desert. I, I, we had good food there. And why, why are we out here? If you really want a good just story about that, listen to Keith Green, so you want to go back to Egypt. and such a great song. But it is... I think Romans 6 is intended to send his audience, Paul intends to send his audience back to Exodus and say, remember how dumb we remember our ancestors being for wanting to go back to Egypt and be slaves again? That's how you're acting right now when you want to keep living according to the passions of your flesh and you want to keep gratifying your sinful desires. That's what you are doing is saying, I want to go back into slavery. I want to go back to Georgia to the plantation because this freedom thing, I don't just seems hard. I don't know. I don't like it. I want to go back. Who would do that? Yet that is a constant struggle we face as Christians because we have sinful desires constantly. And James says, but real saving faith pushes that aside and we constantly have that conviction to say, but I know the truth. Does that mean you won't trip and fall? No, it doesn't. You know, there's many things that I've learned the right way to do them. You know, as I played sports, I learned that, let's just say soccer, I learned the right way to pass a ball, I learned the right way to take a shot, I learned the right way to do different things. Does that mean I did it the exact right way every time I was in a game? No. Sometimes pressure got to me, or things were moving a little fast, and I just got flustered. Same thing in your Christian life. You've learned. You've been in church long enough. You've known the Bible. You, it's written on our hearts. We know right from wrong. Will you still mess up sometimes? Yes. But are you still going to return to building the habits, building the works, doing the things that God has for us to do. And so, what does this mean? Faith without works is dead. Like I said, this passage takes us to extremes too easily. So I want to say, first application from this passage, stay out of the ditches. While Jesus does say, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works, guess what Jesus also tells us? Do not practice your righteousness in front of other people in order to be seen by people. Again, the Bible doesn't contradict itself, so what does he mean? When you practice your righteousness, when you love people, when you serve people, when you are forgiving of people, when you do these things that show the fruit of the Spirit is coming out of you, do it in front of people so that they glorify God, not you. And so when you do this, don't go to a legalistic place where you're wanting people to just talk about how great of a person you are. Always point it back and say, man, anything I have is because of him. And, you know, I, as I share the gospel with people sometimes and I just talk about my need, you know, I... I 
I'm a psychology major, so I've learned the importance of using I language. You know, if you guys learn that in counseling, you got to use I language and you know me language. And so when I share the gospel, I do that a lot of times. Say, man, here's what made me realize my need for a savior. And I've had so many friends say, "You're a good guy." I'm like, number one, no, and number two, anything good about me is not because of me. Trust me. Left to my own desires, left to what I want to do. I'd be in jail right now if not dead, trust me. Like, I, anything good, I'm putting back to God because it is all from Him. So don't practice your righteousness in order to be bragged on. Do it also, the glory goes to God. But also, don't, don't go to the other side and every day say, oh shoot, I got angry again today. I'm probably not really saved. If you know you're saved, like it says, he, when the Spirit's in you, you know. You know, I, I just think about um, when our friend Becca was here with her uh, fiancé, Mitch, a couple weeks ago. You know, we were talking to her, and I remember she's had conversations with Rachel and I as well as some other people. And just, you know, she was in her early 20s, wanted to meet a guy. And just, how do you know? And Rachel and I tried to describe it. And it's just, just, you just did. We just did. I, I don't know. Just, she was better than other women. She's the best one. I don't, I, I just knew. Same way with salvation is... There are a lot of people who can try to trick themselves, but man, when you see somebody who is truly saved, you just know. And I can say as a youth pastor for so many years, I'm not saying I'm the judge of anybody or that I have 100% discernment on who's saved and who isn't saved, but man, you could see it when a teenager accepted Christ. It was amazing. They're just like, who is this person? Like, not that they became just overnight this way better person per se, you just see the desires were different, and that passion to say, my friends need to hear about this, like, yeah, I've been telling you that for four years, why have you not been telling them? You can just see when somebody truly accepts Christ, and it's not just going to the motions, it's not just going to church, it's not just saying, oh yeah, I, I went to Sunday school, and when I was six, and I prayed a prayer that they prayed, and you know, and I, I got dunked, and so I, I'm, I'm good to go. It is obvious in so many ways when somebody truly has that faith and when the, these actions are truly coming from the spirits. And honestly, it's not a lot of times the big things is that you can just see a peace, you can see a patience. That, again, can't point to those fruits of the spirit enough. The second thing along with that, stay out of the ditches, number two, be a living sacrifice. As we talk about the Old Testament, I thank God I was born in New Testament times. Number one, I love bacon. Number two, I just don't know that I really would feel like taking an animal to church to kill it every week. You know, I just feel like that would just weigh on me after a while. It just feels great. Like, I understand why God had in the Old Testament. We can go through the whole purpose of sacrificial system in the Old Testament, but I'm thankful that I'm born on this side of the cross because I don't have to take an animal to church with me and sacrifice it. But what does that mean? Be a living sacrifice. In the same way as they would take animals to say, here is my offering to you, God. I bring you the best of what I have. Make your life the best of what you have. And I think there's a couple ways to look at this. Number one, your life is worship to God. The entire purpose of why you exist is to bring glory to God. <coughs> and only in doing that do we honestly have that best life we were just talking about. And so, it's not about just doing good things without sincerity. We talked about last week when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13... You can do a lot of really good things, but if you don't actually do them out of love for God and love for people, eh, you're wasting your time, wasting your breath, wasting your energy. It's not worth anything. The highest of all goods in the Jewish Old Testament faith, or at least around the time of Jesus, was almsgiving. Man, if you just gave some money to the poor, it <coughs> overlooked a lot of sins. It just, it really helped you out a lot. So Paul specifically includes that one. I don't even really care if you give all your money to the poor. If you do it without love for them, if you don't actually care about them as human beings, what good is it? I remember, and this is not to brag on me by any means, but just to say an example I have of an action of this, I remember going and helping cook a meal for um, a shelter in town one time, and I'm not a very good cook, Randy's really helped me a lot, but this is before we were close, so I did not know how to do anything but microwave, and they were cooking an actual good breakfast, so I said, when you need somebody to serve, let me know, I'm going to go sit over there and talk to some people. And this friend of mine who came a couple times a week to the shelter to cook breakfast for these people for years, he just said, a lot of pastors have come and helped me. You're the first one who ever just went and sat and started talking to the people. 
was like, well, that's kind of sad. I kind of thought of it as me trying to get out of the work, but wow, yeah. It's, it really did, God showed me that, you know, in my own life, I was like, man, I don't know if I do that often enough. Care about the people I'm serving. And so it really was a real life example that he pointed out to me that make sure all your service is like this. Because it wasn't, that's one good example for my life. There's plenty of others where I was probably on the other side. But don't just offer up acts. Make sure they are done in love for God and in gratitude for Him. And works, works are not meant to earn anything. What are works? Works are faith, number one, that when God says something, it's true. When I tell my girls to go to bed at 9 o'clock, why? Because they're kids and it's bad for them not to get enough sleep. Do they always believe me? No. But is it true? I mean, I don't. Maybe sometimes it's selfish, but you know, sometimes it's 8.30 if they're being a little bit loud, but you know, it's just, but I really, it, it is better for you. And I just love whenever they ask, you know, uh, I took them to, I'm sorry, Randy, I took them to Golden Corral um, to eat the other day. And so, I know it offends you. Um, but as I took them to Golden Corral, you know, they asked if they could have desserts. And I just said, I don't know, what have you had? And they went through and they kind of named, what are the healthy things I've had so far? And even they can start to see, my dad has a purpose in making me get green beans. And my dad has a purpose in making me get some chicken he had before I go get the fudge. In the same way, whenever we look at God and say, when you tell me to live in this way, when you tell me not to do the things you tell me not to, when you tell me to do the things you tell me to do, is that just because? No, there's a purpose to it. There's a reason to it. And so, number one, just living out the works that God has for us. Ephesians 2.10, the works he prepared beforehand for us. Evangelism, love, service, keeping away from the works of the flesh. It's because he wants you to live the best life you can. Number two, just simple obedience. I think we've lost that in our free country. You know, I grew up here my whole life. You can't do that. It's a free country. I think you're abusing that term in the same way some people abuse. Well, I'm saved, so I can just do it. Just simple obedience is something we need to learn is respect for our Heavenly Father. And number three out of that, gratitude. Randy really brought this up during Sunday school. When you come, and we talk about the purpose of confessing our sins. Once you're a Christian, your sins are forgiven. You don't need to ask for forgiveness for each individual sin again. Why do we confess? Number one, it helps us to grow closer to God and to just be mindful of what we actually are doing. But number two, man, it really does help you realize what the cost was. When you see how many sins were forgiven by that one sacrifice of Christ, how much gratitude should we have? You know, I think as we become adults and we see the things that our parents sacrificed so that we could have the things that we had, we just become so much more gracious to our parents than we ever were as children. In the same way as we mature as Christians, the more that we see our sins, it should not tear us down, it should not push us down because we know we're forgiven, it should just build up our gratitude. And it should do nothing but that. And the last thing I want to leave you with this morning is, as you look at my faith should lead to works, lead to works, focus on the positive. I mean, there's so many directions to go. We talked about last week, what is the number one commandment? Love God, love your neighbor. Man, it's, I love just to be able to bottleneck it and just say, that can be or my main focus and everything else seen through that filter. So focus on the positive of, am I living a life of service to others? Am I living a life of encouragement to others? Am I living a life where I am helping people by evangelizing, by discipling, by lightening their load wherever I can, whatever it might look like in my own gifts, in my own life, in my own relationships? Am I loving people? But I'm just going to tell you, there have been too many Christians, when they look at faith without works is dead, they start to go to the, all right, well, here's a list of things I'm not going to do. Does that mean that that list isn't important? Not necessarily. There's a lot of things as a Christian shouldn't do. Many of the Ten Commandments are voiced in the negative. Do not murder. That's a very important one. Well, if you focus on loving people, do you think you would ever murder somebody? No. Do not steal. Okay, I'm going to just think about not stealing. No, think about loving people. Would you steal from somebody you love? No, you wouldn't steal from somebody you love. And so when we focus on the positive, I think it is so much more fruitful, and I think that's really what God has in mind, that when you focus on the positive, the negative falls away on its own. When you focus on the negative, it's kind of like sitting in a room with a big red button that says, do not push all day, every day, and eventually you're just going to say, I can't help it anymore. i got to push that button. And that's when we just keep thinking about, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's like, no, 
Just focus on what you should do, and you just don't even have that in your mind anymore a lot of times. Again, are you going to become perfect? No. But focus on love, focus on the fruits of the Spirit, and just living those out. And I'm going to challenge you again. Regularly, whether once a day, once a week, go to 1 Corinthians 13 in your daily quiet time. Go to the fruits of the Spirit in your daily quiet time. I say at least once a week, and just make sure you're familiar with those passages of the fruits of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and just say, God, fill me with your love and help me love people like this. And fill me with your fruits and help me to experience all of these things daily. And make sure that my faith is not just this intellectual faith, just, you know, acknowledging some facts are true. Make sure it's not just tongue service saying, or lip service saying, yes, I believe. Make sure it is a faith that actually is put into action. Let's pray together. So, Lord, we come to you right now, and we just thank you, number one, as we, as we celebrated the Lord's Supper, Lord, and we just acknowledge that the importance of works is there, and we have exhausted that topic, I think, quite well, but help us just to return again to thanking you for the cross and that wonderful cross, Lord. So we just thank you that you did not leave it to us to earn our salvation, Lord, because we know that uh, we would have had no hope. So number one, we just thank you that we're saved by your grace through our faith alone, Lord. But along with that, Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to live a life of gratitude. Help us to live a life of service to you. Because, Lord, we're not free, no matter how much we might think we're free, Lord. And so, Lord, let us not be tricked into trying to ignore your authority because we think we can be our own authority, Lord. But help us to acknowledge that we're either a slave to you or a slave to sin, Lord. And Lord, we know you make such a better slave master than sin ever would. So I just pray for our ability and our desire to follow in our faith with works that you would have for us to do. Just make those clear daily in our lives by your leading of your Holy Spirit. Praise to your name. Amen. You guys would stand with me as we close in singing Knowing You. Welcome back, ladies.
of us are taking off to go down to O'Fallon for a youth encounter, so pray for our safety as we go. Yeah, we're not leaving that way. We're going to run out before the closing prayer. Uh, be in prayer that we make it safely and just be in prayer for us as we go, that God will just speak to us through the music and through the uh, preacher. And the there. So, Bill, would you please close us in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word to us today, Lord. And just pray for your help and applying it to our lives, Lord, and <clears throat> through uh, faith that works, Lord. And just we'll give you the honor and glory, Lord, today. And Lord, we just pray for the youth as they travel today. Pray for safety to their destination to the back. Just pray for your Holy Spirit to work in their lives, Lord, through this. And just pray for safety for everyone. Until we meet again, Lord, until you bring us together again here. And thank you once again for your many blessings to us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.